The shot heard round the world marks the beginning of America's war for independence from Britain. At the battles of Lexington and Concord, militias made up of farmers, merchants, and other everyday citizens unite to ward off British Army troops. The fighting soon spreads to Boston, and again the fearsome army of England is turned back. Perhaps the Americans can win their fight for liberty. The Continental Congress entrusts an official army to George Washington as its commander-in-chief. But as more and more reinforcements arrive from Britain, the tide turns against the Americans. The Continental Army loses a series of battles in Canada and suffers heavy losses. My men are weak in numbers, dispirited, destitute of provisions, with little ammunition, and not a single piece of cannon. General Philip Schuyler, commanding the Northern Department of the Continental Army. The American situation gets even more grim. In August of 1776, the British Commander-in-Chief, General William Howe, soundly defeats Washington's army and captures the city of New York. Thousands of American soldiers are killed, wounded, or captured. Many others lose heart and head for home, while those at home are divided amongst themselves between rebelling patriots and those still loyal to the British crown. The United States of America had been born only a month earlier with the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Now it seems that the new nation, this self-declared democracy, may be put down while still in its infancy. With the American rebellion on the brink of collapse, the British plan to destroy it once and for all. Their strategy is simple. If New England is the birthplace and hotbed of revolution, then Britain will cut it off from the rest of the colonies. Redcoats now control Canada to the north and the city of New York to the south. They hope to connect the two by sending Burgoyne's army from Montreal down the Champlain and Hudson River valleys, capturing all the forts along the way. The course of the river is precisely the route that an army ought to take for the great purpose of cutting the communications between the southern and northern provinces. General John Burgoyne of His Majesty's British Army. Stopping the British is the job of General Philip Schuyler, and the several thousand soldiers at his command. In June of 1777, General John Burgoyne heads south from Montreal, leading 9,000 men, including Loyalist and Canadian troops, Indians, and nearly 4,000 German soldiers for hire. Accompanying the army are hundreds of camp followers, mostly women, nurses, cooks, laundresses, wives, and mothers. At first, the British offensive is successful. Burgoyne's men capture Fort Ticonderoga after a four-day siege. But soon, the British grand scheme misfires. General Howe decides that rather than reinforce Burgoyne's army, he will march to Philadelphia in hopes of luring George Washington's resurgent army into decisive battle. Howe leaves behind General Henry Clinton to oversee the British-occupied city of New York. Burgoyne, now left to fend for himself, sends a detachment of German auxiliaries to nearby Bennington, Vermont, to acquire badly needed provisions, horses, and loyalist assistance. Instead, the detachment is wiped out by an overwhelming force of New England militiamen. Undeterred, Burgoyne marches his weakened army southward toward Albany. General Schuyler has been blamed for the loss of Fort Ticonderoga, and Congress relieves him of command. General Horatio Gates takes command of the Northern Army this day, which I think will put a new face upon our affairs. Major Henry Dearborn, 3rd New Hampshire Regiment. With the advice of his officers, General Gates makes his stand at Bemis Heights near Saratoga, New York. The Hudson River and the high bluffs here create a natural bottleneck choking off Burgoyne's only viable route south to Albany. As the British approach, Gates's army quickly builds a line of fortifications from Bemis Heights west to the summit, topped by the Nielsen House. 
The construction is carried out under the direction of Gates's brilliant military engineer, Colonel Tadeus Kosciusko. His design and location for the batteries on the high bluffs and those on the near riverbank creates a powerful blockade so intimidating to the British that Burgoyne is forced into making a critical decision. Should he run the gauntlet and squeeze through the narrow track between Bemis Heights and the Hudson? A suicidal choice. Or should he move inland and strike at the rebel defenses near the summit to the west? General Burgoyne chooses to strike. Time and the tide of battle have not been kind to the British. Disease, desertion, and the defeat at Bennington have reduced Burgoyne's army to nearly 8,000 men. Meanwhile, for the Americans, fresh Continental and militia regiments have arrived to reinforce Gates's army. The rebels, ready to die in the fight for liberty, grow stronger by the day. General Burgoyne has no clear idea of the American strength or positions. He orders his troops to advance almost blindly in three columns. Two columns will travel a couple of miles inland before turning south with plans to attack the American camp near the summit. The third column, mostly the German auxiliaries, will march along the river. Their main task is to guard the precious and dwindling supplies. The British advance is detected by American scouts. At Gates's headquarters, General Sir, Benedict Arnold insists that the Americans must seize the initiative and meet the British head on. General Gates wants to wait for the British to come up against the well-prepared defenses. But he decides instead to order out Colonel Daniel Morgan and his corps of riflemen and light infantry, whose duty will be to slow and bloody the enemy's advance. It is midday at Freeman's farm. The first shots ring out as scouts encounter each other, and before long, a raging battle begins. The blaze from the artillery and small arms was incessant. By turns, the British and Americans drove each other, taking and retaking the field pieces, often mingling in a hand-to-hand -hand wrestle and fight. Brigadier General Enoch Poor. Through the unceasing carnage, General Arnold orders up all his regiments, a few at a time. Lieutenant Don of the 21st Regiment received a musket ball through the art. When he was wounded, he sprang from the ground nearly as high as a man. Ensign Thomas Andrew, 24th Regiment. As the battle continues, the German column is still marching slowly southward alongside the Hudson River. The sounds of musket and cannon fire drift over from Freeman's farm, but no orders to join the fight arrive. Finally, late in the afternoon, the orders come. German troops and cannons under General Friedrich von Redesel rush toward the fighting, arriving near dusk. The British saw what a powerful assistance we had given them and rushed into the wood together with us in a terrific hurrah. Captain Friedrich Christian Kleber, German staff officer. The German reinforcements swing the balance against the Americans. As night falls on the battlefield, the rebels withdraw under the cover of darkness. Burgoyne believes he's victorious because his troops hold the field of battle. But Bemis Heights and the path to Albany still belong to the Americans. Nearly 600 British officers and men have been killed, wounded, or captured. On the American side, roughly half that number have been lost. As both sides tend to the dying and wounded, the British have the grisly task of carrying out burial duty. Our army abounded with young officers, and in the course of this unpleasant duty, three of the 20th Regiment were interred together, the age of the eldest not exceeding 17. Ensign Thomas Andrew, 24th Regiment. 
General Burgoyne is now desperate for reinforcements. Two days after the battle at Freeman's farm, a glimmer of hope appears. A courier carrying a concealed letter from General Clinton makes his way through hostile territory. Clinton offers to send 2,000 troops north to Burgoyne's aid. Burgoyne digs in and waits for help, clinging to the prospect of aid from Clinton. Over the next days, his soldiers construct log and earthen fortifications to protect their camp. The two fortifications guarding Burgoyne's western flank are known for the officers who command them, the Bremen Redoubt and the Balcaris Redoubt. Meanwhile, behind the American lines, dissension threatens to tear the army apart. General Gates's report to Congress on the battle at Freeman's farm fails to mention Benedict Arnold or his division by name. General Arnold is deeply insulted, believing that Gates is jealous of his courage and leadership. The volatile Arnold storms into Gates's quarters, and the two engage in a heated argument. When Benedict Arnold threatens to leave the Northern Army, Gates writes him a pass for Philadelphia and effectively relieves Arnold of his command. The quarrel spreads to the senior officers. I did not choose to serve General Gates, and I will sooner see him drawn and quartered than do anything for him out of my line. But Arnold, I will cheerfully serve. Lieutenant Colonel Richard Verrick, aide to General Arnold. In the end, Arnold stays, but with victory or defeat on the line, the American commanders are caught up in their loathing and distrust of each other. Two tense weeks have passed since the battle at Freeman's farm, and the British position is desperate. Supplies are critically low, and Burgoyne's forces have dwindled to around 7,000, while the Americans have mustered nearly 13,000 men, with more militia regiments on the way. Burgoyne decides he can wait no longer for help from General Clinton in New York, and proposes an aggressive attack on the Americans. His officers argue in vain for a retreat to the north. Burgoyne compromises. He will send out a portion of his army to probe the American positions and forage for food, a so-called reconnaissance in force. If the Americans are vulnerable, Burgoyne will launch an all-out attack the following day. If not, he will consider retreat. General Burgoyne deploys a detachment at Barber's Wheat Field near Freeman's farm on October 7, 1777. Foragers begin to harvest the desperately needed grain. An American advance guard notices the activity and reports the situation to Gates. I reported, they are foraging and I think, sir, they offer you battle. General Gates replied, well then, order on Morgan to begin the game. Lieutenant Colonel James Wilkinson, American staff officer. Gates orders up Morgan's riflemen and light infantry to strike at the British right flank and Poor's brigade to strike at the British left. The attacks launch at virtually the same time. The Redcoats are overwhelmed. Morgan's corps leaped over the fence in their front, gave three cheers and charged with such impetuosity that the enemy gave way and ran off in disorder without firing a gun. Major Henry Dearborn, Corps of Light Infantry Commander. Again and again, Burgoyne's lines are reformed and broken. The relentless rebels pummel Burgoyne's men, driving them back. General Burgoyne orders a retreat, but the instructions never get through. A German artillery unit at the center of the British line is firing so ferociously that the rebels are held back. Suddenly, Benedict Arnold rides onto the field, rallying the Americans forward against the German fire. The Germans fall back, joining the combined British withdrawal to the nearby Balcaris Redoubt. Arnold and Poor's men stay fast on their heels, they attack this gigantic fortification. Volcaris Redoubt holds fast against the Americans. The much weaker Bremen Redoubt, manned by German troops, is faltering. Arnold joins the attack, developing to the rear of Bremen Redoubt, 
with the fervor of a man possessed. The Germans are taken completely by surprise, and the redoubt gives way. Our general thought little of danger and forced his way through and spared none until a ball broke his leg and killed his horse. But his brave men, not discouraged with their misfortune, drove them from their camp with their tents standing and pots boiling. Oliver Boardman, Connecticut Militia. As night falls, the fighting ends. Only this time, it is Burgoyne's army that must withdraw from the field of battle. The next day, the weary, ragged British force trudges through rain and mud eight miles north to Saratoga. They dig in, desperate for relief. Gates's army steadily pursues and surrounds the British camp. The rebels begin a full-scale siege, 17,000 Americans sporadically bombarding and skirmishing against barely 6,000 of the enemy. The siege drags on for five days as Burgoyne and his officers mull over their limited options. Although Burgoyne gives up hope of rescue by General Clinton, he is unwilling to concede defeat. Finally, he and Gates negotiate an end to the fighting, the Convention of Saratoga. On October 17, 1777, Burgoyne's army ceremonially lays down its arms. Face to face with Burgoyne, General Gates declares, I am glad to see you. The humiliated Burgoyne responds, I am not glad to see you. It is my fortune, sir, and not my fault that I am here. Although General Burgoyne cannot bring himself to utter the word, the truth is that for the first time, the mightiest army in the world has surrendered to the newest. The French, who have mostly stayed out of the war to this point, are swayed by the rebels' convincing victory at Saratoga. France declares war on England and allies itself with America. Exactly four years later, aid from the French Navy and Army will tip the balance in the siege of Yorktown. America will win that battle and ultimately triumph in its war for independence. The victory at Saratoga was the turning point of the Revolutionary War. Those that took part in what happened here on both sides changed the fate of America and the world. These fields and forests, hills and ravines, are a monument to their valor and their sacrifice. It is hallowed ground, consecrated by their blood, their courage, and their spirit. <laughs>